Welcome back to Presbyterian 101. In the first episode, we looked at the origins of the Presbyterian Church and met four of the forebears of our tradition, Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Knox, and Francis McCamey. Now we turn to the important and daunting question, what do Presbyterians believe? It's a daunting question because, frankly, it's impossible to answer. I cannot tell you what all Presbyterians believe. As we state on the Westminster website, there is far too much diversity of thought in our family of faith to state with conviction this is what everyone at Westminster believes. Furthermore, as an ordained pastor of the Presbyterian Church USA, I cannot tell you what you should believe. I can teach you about our tradition, including the essential tenets of the Reformed faith. I can interpret scripture, and with the Spirit's help, I can strive to proclaim the word of God faithfully. I can give you tools to study scripture on your own and in groups, but I cannot tell you exactly what you should believe. Because God alone is Lord of the conscience. This statement appears in our Book of Confessions and Book of Order, which together make up the Presbyterian Church USA Constitution. We'll talk more about the basis for this claim later on, but let me start with a quick explanation. God alone is Lord of the conscience means that one's conscience is captive to the Word of God. Only God's Word has the right to bind it. This does not mean that anything goes— but it does mean that our tradition allows for dissent. If a community standard is contrary to one's informed understanding of Scripture, God sets us free to dissent from it. In other words, when it comes to specifics of theology, there is room for interpretation, and people of sincere faith can and do disagree. This is why I can't tell you what all Presbyterians believe. So now that I've set myself up for failure, let's talk about what Presbyterians generally believe about God and the world God made. To ensure we're all on the same page, let me start with this. The Presbyterian Church USA is a Christian denomination, which means there are certain theological claims that we share with other Christian denominations around the world. For instance, We believe in the triune God, that is, one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We consider the Bible, namely the Old and New Testaments, to be sacred scripture. And like other Christians, we celebrate baptism and communion. Our understanding of the sacraments differs from that of other denominations, and sometimes we use different language to describe what happens at the font and at the table. But ultimately, these rituals unite us with the larger Christian family. This means, for instance, that someone who is baptized in a Catholic or a Methodist or a Baptist church does not need to be re-baptized to join a Presbyterian congregation. For as Ephesians reminds us, there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. These are but a few examples of the core beliefs we share with Christians of other denominations. I'm not going to spend time on these teachings, not because I don't care about unity, but because we'd be here all day. Instead, I'm going to focus on some of the distinctive tenets of our particular tradition, the tradition we call Reformed Christianity. These are theological claims we can trace to the period of reformations, which we talked about in the first episode, and specifically to the man lauded as the father of the Reformed tradition. That's right, John Calvin. Let's go back to the groundbreaking theological claim that we touched on in the first episode, the doctrine of justification by faith, not by faith and good works. As a reminder, This doctrine speaks to the way human beings are made right with God. Of course, a theology of justification would not be necessary if it weren't for the reality of human sin. 
This is another assertion we hold in common with other Christians. The confession that, though God created humankind in the divine image, we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, theologians and traditions differ on understandings of human sinfulness. Our boy Calvin, for instance, had a robust theology of sin, to put it mildly. Though he was very clear that sin is an aberration of our created identity— Calvin believed that it had so completely distorted our nature that we are essentially incapable of doing good without the Holy Spirit at work in us. Calvin gets a bad rap for what has become known as his doctrine of total depravity. And yes, his descriptions of humankind are a little harsh. But on the flip side, Calvin had an even more robust theology of God's grace. He truly, joyfully believed that, quote, depraved human beings are made right with God by God's lavishly generous gift of grace. Which brings us back to the doctrine of justification by faith. In the words of Martin Luther, this claim is the centerpiece of our teaching. A generation later, Calvin echoed the statement calling the the doctrine of justification the main hinge on which religion turns. So central is the belief that human beings are justified by faith and faith alone that this one revelation inspired the 16th century reformers to reinterpret scripture and reframe their understanding of God. But what's so radical about affirming that sinners are justified by faith, not by faith and good works? Are the two really so different? After all, it's easy to hear the phrase, we are justified by faith alone, and assume the reformers traded one merit-based approach to salvation for another, right belief instead of right action. Asserting that we're justified by faith still kind of makes it sound like it's up to us to secure our own salvation, right? But as theologian Daniel Migliori puts it, a major distortion of the doctrine occurs if it is taken to mean that faith is the human act by which we merit justification. Migliori's explanation of this doctrine is helpful. Sinners are justified before God not by their good works, but by God's grace alone, received by faith alone. This teaching does not mean that our faith rather than our works is the way we achieve our salvation. Rather, the grace of God is freely given and is gratefully and trustingly received by faith alone. Do you hear the difference? It's subtle, but important. The difference between the Roman church's understanding of justification and the reformers' understanding of justification lies in who is acting to heal the relationship broken by sin. Suggesting that sinners can restore the relationship with God through right belief or right action places salvation in the hands of human beings. However, Believing that we can do nothing of our own accord to merit justification places salvation in the hands of a gracious God. Now, this may not sound like good news, especially to type A personalities. After all, the doctrine of justification by faith strips human beings of control. Or more accurately, it forces us to admit that we never had control over our eternal fate. The good news is that our eternal fate lies in the hands of the triune God, the one who creates, redeems, and sustains by grace. The 16th century reformers referred to this central doctrine by the Latin phrase sola fide, by faith alone. This theological slogan became the first in a set of foundational principles that still distinguish Reformed Christianity from other traditions. Even now, 500 years later, we call these tenets the sole, meaning alone. The other sole are inextricably linked to the doctrine of sola fide, 
The first, sola gratia, by grace alone, means that God's grace is entirely sufficient to heal the relationship between God and our broken world. The life of faith is a response to God's unconditional acceptance of us. The second, sola scriptura, or by scripture alone, speaks to the question of authority. Daniel Migliori defines sola scriptura this way, The scriptures of the Old and New Testaments are the only necessary source and sufficient norm of Christian faith and life. Unlike the Roman Church, which viewed ecclesiastical tradition as a source of revelation independent from scripture, and gave sole authority to interpret both scripture and tradition to church councils, the Reformers declared the Word of God revealed in the Old and New Testaments to be the ultimate authority for Christians, and considered church tradition and teachings subordinate to Scripture. This conviction propelled the Reformers to get Scripture, the source of renewal, freedom, and joy, into the hands of everyday Christians so that they could discover the Bible's liberating message for themselves. Thus, translating scripture from Latin, which was the language of the Roman church, into the vernacular became a centerpiece of the Protestant Reformation. Sola fide, sola gratis, sola scriptura. The foundational principles of Reformed Christianity make it clear that time and again, God chooses to draw near to us. When the relationship between the creator and creation is marred by sin, God chooses to restore the relationship by grace alone, a gift which we receive by faith alone. Even scripture, the word of God, is God's generous self-disclosure, so that by scripture alone we might know the story of God's great love for us. Our own effort to draw near to God, whether through worship or study or service, is in fact a response to the grace we have already received. As far as Calvin is concerned, even faith is a gift we receive from God. Listen to his definition. Faith is the firm and certain knowledge of God's benevolence toward us, both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Both revealed to our minds and sealed upon our hearts through the Holy Spirit. To have faith means that God has already acted on our behalf, enabling our minds to seek after and our hearts to trust in the one who claims us for relationship. God's desire to draw near to us can be interpreted by a principle Daniel Migliori calls the electing grace of God. The doctrine of election, or predestination, is a hallmark of the Reformed tradition. However, it's also a doctrine that has been significantly misunderstood over the years. Somewhere along the line, you may have heard predestination described this way. God has predestined some for heaven and some for hell. That is actually double predestination, and that is not what Calvin had in mind when he described election. In fact, Calvin thought the notion that God had decreed some for eternal damnation was downright dreadful. So what does predestination actually mean? Well, the doctrine of election is rooted in the biblical understanding of covenant. Back in Genesis, God first told Abraham and Sarah, I will be your God and you will be my people. And so God freely entered into covenant partnership with the Hebrew people, pledging to be faithful to them and asking for their faithfulness in return. Then in Christ Jesus, God established a new covenant, which includes both Gentile and Jew. The doctrine of election affirms that the same God who established covenants with our ancestors in the faith chooses us for relationship. Daniel Migliori describes election this way. The doctrine of election is the best of all words that can be said or heard. 
that in Christ, God elects humanity as covenant partner, that apart from any need or constraint, the freely gracious God chooses to be God for humanity. Now, who constitutes the, quote, elect is a matter of some debate among Reformed Christians. John Calvin did believe that some were elect and some were not. However, he was clear to point out that we, even we church folk, do not know God's eternal decrees. Therefore, we should treat everyone as if they are God's elect. To this end, Calvin strongly warned against viewing the doctrine of election in an arrogant, fearful, or merely curious manner, presenting it instead as a doctrine that gives assurance and confidence to believers as they serve God and others. Many Reformed Christians have moved boldly beyond Calvin and affirm a far more inclusive understanding of election. After all, how could a gracious God who creates, redeems, and sustains in love condemn any part of creation to everlasting death? This debate is one example of that whole God alone is Lord of the conscience thing that I mentioned earlier. Wherever you fall on this spectrum, the doctrine of election is intended to be a source of assurance and confidence. It is intended to be good news. At any rate, focusing on the question of who overlooks a key aspect of this doctrine, which is the question of what. As people who believe in the electing grace of God, what is our response? An easy way to sum up the full measure of this doctrine is this. We are elect for salvation and for service. Each and every one of us is called to respond to God's gift of grace with gratitude by giving ourselves in service to Jesus Christ. This goes back to the sole. Though we cannot earn our salvation, we respond to God's free gift by doing good works that extend God's grace to others. The doctrine of election is central to our Reformed understanding of the triune God. Yet, for John Calvin, there is an even more foundational belief that underscores this and every other Christian doctrine. A belief in the absolute sovereignty of God. Calvin wholeheartedly believed that God is the governor of all things, who, having formed us for good, continues to work in and through creation to bring about divine purposes. This conviction that God is sovereign is evident in the way Reformed Christians talk about election. Remember Migliore's description of election as the best of all words that can be said or heard? That in Christ, God elects humanity as covenant partner, that apart from any need or constraint, the freely gracious God chooses to be God for humanity. As Lord of all creation, God is a free actor, not bound by duty or obligation. And yet, and yet, God chooses to share life with others. For Calvin, this unwavering belief in the sovereignty of God only makes God's grace all the more astounding. For the Lord of all time does not create, sustain, and redeem the world out of necessity, but out of a deep desire for relationship. Since the sovereignty of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is a focal point of Calvin's theology— it's no surprise that a visual representation of this doctrine has become the focal point of the stained glass window at the back of Westminster Sanctuary, the one I described in the first episode of Presbyterian 101. You thought I forgot about it, didn't you? As you might recall, the central image of this window is a depiction of Christ standing atop the world, planets swirling overhead and on either side, Jesus' followers kneeling in worship. It visually proclaims that Jesus 
is Lord. What does this mean? Well, it means that Jesus is Lord of our lives, the one to whom Christians are called to serve with all our heart and soul. Christ calls us to a loyalty that transcends every earthly claim on the human heart. In other words, when we confess Christ as Lord, we submit ourselves to Jesus' way of love, justice, and peace. Of course, the confession that Jesus is Lord informs that Presbyterian catchphrase I mentioned earlier, God alone is Lord of the conscience, which gets at the idea that God's word, revealed in scripture and illumined by the Holy Spirit, has authority over our lives and is the plumb line against which we measure right belief and right action. Whenever we gather in our sanctuary, this stunning image of Christ atop the world reminds us that we worship the exalted one who reigns o'er all the earth. This talk of sovereignty and lordship might sound a bit foreign, maybe even a bit off-putting to those of us raised to embrace democratic ideals. Interestingly enough, in a roundabout way, Calvin's understanding of God's sovereignty influenced American democracy by giving shape to our form of government. But that's a subject for a different day. When John Calvin and his theological descendants talk about the absolute sovereignty of God, it is not about fealty or subjugation or anything else we associate with the monarchs of history. The key difference, of course, is the character of our sovereign. And as I hope I've made clear, the sovereign we worship is none other than God Almighty, the one who chooses to draw near to us the one who created the world out of a deep desire to share life with others, the one whose steadfast love sustains the world, the one who redeems the world through a deep well of mercy, a fountain of overflowing grace. So overwhelming, so awesome is this grace that it seems to me the only appropriate response is to kneel before God, our sovereign Lord, just like the disciples depicted in our stained glass window, and then to rise and follow this one into the world in joyful service. We'll talk about some of the ways Presbyterians put this theology into practice in the next episode of Presbyterian 101.